Yeah, all right, cool. Let's make a start. It's great to see so many people who want to come and hear me talk rubbish. Uh, yeah, thanks all for coming. Um, this will be an introduction to CI CD pipelines. Um, so, you know, kind of in this, there'll be less kind of fo code focused and more just kind of uh, focusing on the like the principle and the philosophy of what it means to have a CI CD pipeline, put it into terms of what it means for PowerShell, because this concept of a pipeline is not just PowerShell focused, it's true in the development circles of any language. You know, it's the basically the idea of automating the deployment and testing of your code. You know, if if you wanted to leave now, that's pretty much it. I've just summarized it in one sentence. So Many thanks to our sponsors, um, Patch My PC and uh, Chocolatey. Um, you know, ticket sales help, sponsorship also helps. Couldn't do days like this without them, so yep, thanks to them both. And I'm a customer engineer at Patch My PC, so um, yeah, my name's Adam Cook, and yeah, my role is kind of weird. It, I spend a lot of time working with customers, helping them solve their challenges of third-party patching. Patch My PC integrates with WSAS, ConfigMan, SCCM, and, and Intune. Um, so if anybody wants to talk fair party patching, I can do it all day, every day. Um, but my skills primarily are just PowerShell, ConfigMan, and, and Azure. That's where I spend a lot of my time. I consider myself a bit of a generalist. I like to play in a lot of variety of things, very much like five miles wide and two inches deep kind of thing. But if I was to pick three that I'd prefer and favorite and probably okay, and I'd pick these three. And... Um, yeah, PowerShell Southampton, so I organize, if you live anywhere near Southampton in the south of the country, I run a user group for PowerShell. Um, things have been pretty quiet over the last year. In the last year, I've got married, had a son, moved house, so I'm tired, so I haven't really organized much, um, but I'm hoping to pick it up a bit more again this year. So if you're local, uh, go to the website, sign up to the meetup, get notifications when new events come up. And then throughout the, uh, at the bottom corner there, you'll see a QR code where it'll take you to my GitHub repo where you can get a copy of the slide deck if you wanted to snag a copy of that. That QR code will be on a few slides throughout. Um, but yeah. Uh, so, introduction to CI CD pipeline. So, there, it's an acronym, right? So, CI, continuous integration, CD, continuous deployment, or continuous delivery. And in essence, to, to make, and, it, and it's called a pipeline because preferably a sequence of events have to occur, preferably, so you, it has a starting point. But generally, to have a pipeline, you are ensuring that your code continuously integrates. Just means, does my code, is it integratable into production? Is it integratable into some kind of tested working solution that's ready to go into production? And that's testing, and I'll show you a little bit more about that later. And then deployment or delivery, that's kind of a little bit self-explanatory. That's just the idea of getting your code from A to B, getting it into production in an automated way. So that is kind of vague, because that might mean different things for different people in their own projects. If it's community tools, it could mean put it on the PowerShell gallery, make it a marked or a tagged release in GitHub, if it's internal, you might put it on an internal NuGet feed, you might copy to a file share, you might send it to a particular server or publish it to an Azure function, um, whatever deployment means for you, and it's unique per project, really. But the idea of a pipeline is to automate this to uh, ensure that your code continuously integrates into a production-ready state and also get it into production. And it starts... In a pipeline state, at the first step, is make a change to your code and check it into source control. So you fix the bug, you've added a feature, um, and this is the beginning of your, your pipeline. And then you build, generally, is the next step. And for me, this is the hardest thing to really comprehend for PowerShell, because it's easier in lower languages where your built artifact is like a, like a binary exe or library. In PowerShell, it's a little bit more vague. Um, but the easy ex example of building PowerShell, because it's weird, right? You probably think, right, I've, writ I've written a code, I've written a module, I've already built code, what more do I need to do to build it? 
Um, but the easiest example I can give you is uh, PowerShell modules. Um, so if no one here has had any experience of writing a module, heard about it, haven't started it yet, no problem, stick with me. But a really nice example is that the aim of the game here is to get all of your module code into one file, one PSM, one file. There's a lot more that can happen in the build process, but that's the essence of it. And I'm just showing a quick screenshot from a project that I kind of tinker with, and it's just a small little module that I kind of support for a web service. And um, the aim of the game here in modules generally, and this is forever debated, how you structure your module directory. You have a bunch of PSM, PS1 script files, one per function. And then to build a module, you want to take the content from all of those files and put them into one PSM1 file. I'm just showing you on the PowerShell gallery what that kind of final built file sort of artifact looks like of when you've done that kind of concatenation of all your functions into one PSM1 file. So that's the easiest example I can give you when you're talking about building PowerShell. So you, you, there's generally a little bit more that you can do in a build process, but in essence, the build step is, is that. The idea here is to have a artifact, to compile an artifact that you can then test with. Um, and the idea with testing is that you now want to measure the kind of like the response of your code. You would give it a predictable input, and you would ideally have a predictable output, and you're just measuring that output. Is that true or is that false? Did that test pass? Did that test fail? There are a bunch of community tools kind of help you with this, help you codify your pipeline, and I'll show you some examples. But the test, you know, the most popular framework in PowerShell is, um, is PESTA. Um, but the idea is, is that once you've built your artifact, so your module, that PSM1 file, generally you have a manifest as well, but once you've built your code, you've tested it, at that point, really, uh, there's not really much reason to not put it into production. Ideally, you've written your tests in a way so that you have faith in your code quality that it is ready to go into production. So then you do the continuous deployment part where you put it into production. And I gave some examples earlier about what that might look like. But at a high level, this is the pipeline. Those three steps. You check in, you start the pipeline, you, you check in your code, you, you ensure that it is continuously integratable uh, with a build step and a test step, and then you kick it off into production. And the definition of deployment or delivery generally comes from uh, this step here that I've circled here. So I don't know if everybody can see that, but there's a red circle at the end there. And it's just human intervention. Um, to continuously have deployment, it automates that step. You, you've written, you have faith in your code that it sends it straight to production with no human intervention, but to have continuous delivery, this is the distinction. You would have a, a human sort of approval, go, no, go decision of whether to put it into production. Um, you know, it might be bureaucratic, it might be whatever reason to have that need to have the human decision, but yeah. At the, yes, at the core of it, this is what a pipeline in any language, in any circle, in any kind of life cycle you might adopt will look like at a high level. Um, which is great, you know, but I haven't really sold you on why to do it. Um, and one of the reasons why I think that you should do it if you don't already do it is because it will make you feel liberated. Um, you know, if, so use, use a community tool as an example. You have a community tool, it could be at work, but run with it. And you, you, you've got a request or you've seen a bug, you've heard of a bug, and once you fix that bug, you then don't want to go through this like laborious task process of needing to remember, okay, what do I now need to do to test it? Have I broken the core functionality of my code? Oh, I must remember to rotate the release notes or include the release notes, you know? And to feel liberated means that you can just put all that to one side into an automated process, you know, just, just forget all of that, just focus on 
delivering the value that you first achieved in your code. You know, fix it and then just push it and then have faith in this pipeline that it will take care of everything for you. Because some of these tasks they do, you do once in a blue moon. You're not going to remember them all. And worse yet, uh, like what tests do I need to do again? You'll probably end up with something stupid like an Excel sheet with like a test list or something. And then you'll have like a, like there's a use case for test cases, right? But you'll probably have like a checklist of things to do. But just imagine you, you've got a feature request, just focus on that feature and then just have faith that you have a pipeline to back you up and ensure that you still kind of remove that, that manual labor. Um, and then reduce risk of abandonment. So I've definitely fallen prone to this before. I, I've, I've written code and um, I know that it needs a bug fix. I know that it could do an improvement, but the thought of needing to kind of remember how to, to kind of get it on the gallery, to get it onto that new get feed. Oh, what's the URL for the endpoint for that new get feed? What's the API key? Where do I get that from? Um, what tests do I need to do? You know, and then you just think, well, sorry, I'm not going to do it. Um, and, th and that's the risk. You know, by having this automated pipeline that you can throw your code into, you just reduce that risk of, of abandoning what you've, you know, the problem you want solved. Um, and then with PowerShell, you know, this is a language that you can automate stuff, services, people. Well, that's actually a horrible thing to say. You don't automate people. I'll take that back. Um, you automate services, comes between services. So you've automated something, so automate the deployment. You know, just it's, when you put it like that, it's a little bit of a no-brainer. Consistent artifacts, that's key for me. Whenever I check in a new change, I want to have faith that that module that, that is out the receiving end, that's now public facing, it's on the gallery. I want to have faith that it is consistent. I want to have faith that its version number is not going to contain a typo or its release notes are going to always be there um, or that it is always going to be in the PowerShell gallery. And if it ends up not being in the PowerShell gallery, I'll get told about it because the pipeline will fail. So just having that kind of consistent end result artifact is, is key. And this one I kind of no doubt there's more like pros and why you should do a pipeline. And I kind of contemplated on bothering with this last one because I don't want to tell you that by having a pipeline, more people are going to help you. Like, that's just not going to happen. Like, you, you're the last person that touched it, so you own it, right? But the, the idea is, is that if you've got, if you have a pipeline, you can ask people to contribute to your code and just easily tell them, hey, once you've made the change in the code, do this to invoke the pipeline, and it will test it for you. And it will even give you a little binary, whether it's an MSI or, or a module, at the end of it for you to then kind of have as like a beta release and alpha release do some testing with. And that just eliminates that kind of upfront cost for new contributors, whether it's internal or external. So not just talking about open source code. It could be internal colleagues as well. You just reduce that barrier of people being able to kind of help you. Um, it's an easy thing to tell someone, right, OK, fix the code, and then check it in and get that artifact. And that just eliminates them needing to know every corner of your code. They don't need to necessarily know all of the finer detail inner workings because, preferably, your tests will still test those. And if what the change is done, and if it breaks those, then, then you, you know, you've got an automated way to catch that. And the idea is, by the way, if I go back, if anything in this pipeline fails, if the build process fails, we fail to compile, we fail to test, the idea is that we abort the whole thing. And there's no right or wrong here. If you'd prefer not to abort and continue going, like, that's cool, but I'm just emphasizing generally the idea is that if your code is not continuously degradable, abort. Um, and this whole pipeline shenanigan stuff can, can happen in, in hosted environments. And, or, or on-premises environments. And there are some tools and services that you can use to kind of do your orchestration of automation in your pipeline within. And they're generally called CI runners, is, is a general co kind of coin term that you'll hear. And GitHub Actions, I'm, I love GitHub Actions. I'm most familiar with GitHub Actions, and there's a few listed here. Um, these are all services that you can use 
for your pipeline. So that entire process of having an environment, whether it's a VM or a container, to build and test and kick off the deployment. You do that all within a CI runner. And GitHub Actions, if you scan that QR code, it takes you to a YouTube video where I did a talk on kind of giving you, like from the very beginning, an intro into GitHub Actions. So if you've been wanting to learn it for a little while, check out that video. I give you a nice little, little intro to it. Um, Azure DevOps pipelines, Harness, Harness IO. I didn't know about until Yap. Yap's a speaker here today, and um, he works for Harness, and that's a that's a popular CI runner. Now Octopus Deploy. I got a question mark there. Hoping someone in here can help me. I always thought Octopus Deploy was like an alternative service to like a CI runner, but I went on their website and it was kind of advertised integrate with GitHub Actions. And I don't understand, because why? if you're a competitor, why would you integrate with? So I don't know if anybody has any experience with Octopus Deploy to be able to kind of give us a quick, like, what is it? Am I right? Am I wrong? OK, cool. Well, we'll all never know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but Jenkins, if you can't use cloud services, don't want to use cloud services, there is a um, on-premises solution written in Java that you can use. Um, same thing. Um, I think I started learning it once, but then didn't. So I can't vouch for, generally speaking, I can't really vouch for anything other than GitHub Actions. I just know that these are alternatives that you can use. But I'm a big proponent for GitHub Actions, especially if we're talking about community tools. They provide a very, very generous free tier um, for you to kind of do everything that you need. And then community modules. So let me kind of go through the whole list here. How are we doing for time? Nice. Um, to do to help you codify your pipeline, you, you have a bunch of PowerShell community tools to kind of help you here. And these are all different in their own way. So I'll just kind of draw out some boxes to kind of just emphasize that these are different or similar. So if it's in a box on its own, it's generally it's in its own league. Whereas if it's kind of paired, then you have the option of one or the other. So Pester, this will help you with testing. This is a great framework, meaning that it just provides you with really nice functions with a slightly quirky syntax, but to really create a really clean script file to do testing in. Again, scan that QR code. There is actually a playlist that Jakob has put together. The current one of the maintainers, probably the leading maintainer, for Pesta, where it has just years of getting started with, with Pesta. So if you've been putting it off, get involved, it's great. I only started learning about six months ago, and it is uh, it's great. Um, the top video there is, um, what is that top video? That's one by, done by Jakob himself. Um, so yeah, that would be a great one not to miss. It's PS Script Analyzer, that's a linter. If you don't know what a linter is, basically a tool just to verify that syntactically your code is correct, um, and also to make sure that it, um, is syntactically to your preferences as well, syntactically correct to your preferences. So you can create custom rules in PS Script Analyzer to make sure that it's written in a way that you like. But otherwise, there are kind of community standards that it has in by default. Invoke Build, PSake, these are building frameworks. Um, much like Pesta, they have helpful functions, and again, in their own kind of weird syn syntax way. but. They enable you to create a clean script file where you're focusing on the build process. And in a minute, I'm going to do something pretty wild. I'm going to kick off a new, I'm going to kick off a pipeline for a module that I maintain that I currently have, to have in the develop branch. And I'm going to merge it into, master, into the main branch. I'm going to hope that it works. And it probably won't. I don't even think I'm connected to Wi Fi, so it definitely won't work. I'll have to fix that. But um, you have the option between the two invoke build or psake. I have experience of invoke build, so I can vouch for that. I like that. I don't have experience of psake, but it is also equally as popular, maybe more. Don't know, but you have options. Module builder and sampler. If you are looking for a way to have boilerplate code for module development and a pipeline, check these out. Rob, is he here? No, is doing a session today at two on Sampler. And Sampler and Module Builder, they provide a template for you in effect in order to start creating modules and also give you like a base pipeline, which I think uses ADO, I think. I'm looking at Jessica's maybe. Yes, but rather than rewriting, you get back to the nice. Awesome. 
cool. So yeah, if you haven't tinkered with modules before, or if you do tinker with modules, but you're kind of at loose ends, of, we're trying to adopt a standard folder structure, a standard development practice, because things are really wild in PowerShell module development. There is no hard or fast rule. There's just community guidelines. And a platypus, um, platypus, 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 um, this is nice. Uh, this helps you automate creating documentation for your code. Literally, you feed it your code, and it creates documentation. But that, that sounds too good to be true. You, in PowerShell functions, you have comment-based help, a section dedicated to documenting your code within your code, and it can generate markdown files for you. And these are all tools that help you codify your pipeline process. Um, so this is where I am going to do something that might fail, and that's perfectly OK. But I hope it works, because it will hopefully help you see the benefit of adopting a CI CD pipeline. So what I'm going to do is come out here, and I'll explain what I'm going to do in just a second. But I know I need to connect to Wi-Fi. And it's enter space, right? Thanks. I'm going to grab a drink while that connects. So uh, I have a, a PowerShell module. I have a few, but this one I haven't actually touched since um, uh, April. So my son was born in, in June, uh, and we moved around about May. So I haven't touched it since April, and it's been long due an update because the service, Schlink, is a URL shortening service, and I created a PowerShell module to kind of help you interact with it with nice functions. Um, and it has long since it updated its API at least four or five times. There's been a new major version to its API, so I had to do some changes. Um, so what I'm going to do is I actually updated the module on a developed branch a couple of nights ago, and as soon as I merge it into the main branch, it's going to kick off my GitHub action, and it's going to do my pipeline. And we will see, hopefully, it might fail, but we will see it create a new version as a release in GitHub and also put it on um, PowerShell Gallery. So right now, we're on uh, 0, 10, 2. Am I connected to Wi-Fi yet? Yeah, nice. I'm just going to refresh just to make sure. Nice. OK. Um, and if I come to VS Code, I might want to zoom in a little bit. Yeah. On the left-hand side here, it's pretty much in this commit on these files that I have changed. So two nights ago, I modified these files. I added support for the latest version of Schlink. And I have not yet pushed it to my main branch. So that means right now, anybody who would like to use my module uh, basically don't have the latest version. So what I'm going to do is is I've already actually merged it. I did it last night kind of out of fear. Yeah, so I'm just ready to push. So this might fail, and that's OK. But what we'll do is that we'll come to GitHub, and we should see the GitHub action start. No? Oh, I think it's because the pipeline is disabled, maybe? Yeah, I hadn't. GitHub Actions has a thing where if you don't use it for a while, it turns itself off. Um, yeah, so uh, that's OK. So normally, I have a manually invoke button here, which I can do. So in this scenario, you can, uh, you, you can actually manually invoke your pipeline as well. So generally, in a perfect world, you, you, you would do a pull request, put it into the main branch, and then that would be your, your, your start of your pipeline. But I missed out here. That's not a big deal in GitHub Actions. And many other t services, too. I can just manually invoke that. I'm just going to click Run Workflow. And what we'll see here, let me go into its logs, and we can just kind of see at a high level what it's going to get up to. <coughs> this will spawn in the cloud in GitHub Actions, which I guess is now Microsoft Cloud or whatever. Um, it will create a small environment. I don't know whether it's a container or whether it's a VM, but it's the equivalent of. It will create a small environment, and it will check in my code. It will take it from the repository and put it on disk in that VM. Then it will go through the motion of trying to determine what should the next version number be for me. And that's using a tool called git version. Yeah, git version. I couldn't remember its name. I know I use it. 
Um, and then it will just go through everything I just pretty much said. It will build it, so it will concatenate everything into one PSM1 file. It will populate the manifest with its new version number. It will make sure the list of exported commands is, is everything that's in my public folder in my, my module. Um, and then it will test it. So I have a test script file, which I'll show you in a minute at the end of this once it's finished. Um, and in fact, it's doing it right now. It's running a bunch of pester tests, which it has just finished. And it looks like it all passed. Yeah. So, But it's funny, because um, when I updated the module two days ago, I didn't write tests for the changes I made. So it's cool. <laughs> um, and then now it's at the step to publish to the gallery. So I know I've mentioned this already, but just to tell you what I did, Two nights ago, I focused on adding support for the new API. I looked at the new Swagger spec for the vendors, for the Strings API, and I didn't care about anything else. I just looked at what's changed and added those changes to my code. I didn't even think about, did it break anything fundamental? I didn't even think about, OK, where does it need to go now? I have just had faith that my pipeline has done it for me. So this is done now. So what I'm going to do is hopefully see that new version is a release. I think it should be 11. Yeah, 011. And um, it's got a nice, and this is what I mean by consistent artifacts, in the release. And this is also information in the manifest too, the release notes. It's just every release is like this. I can just know that I have faith that every release has a very predictable and a very standard output. All of its artifacts follow like a nice, clean, tidy output. Um, and the same would be true for gallery. Yeah? Those outputs, is that from Slack and Twitter or Slack CS, whatever it's called, that generates that what's changed? Uh, no, actually. That's um, using a module called changelog management. Yeah. Um, that's really nice. So you would maintain a changelog markdown file in your repo. And you would have, before I push this, it, all of this stuff here was under the release section. As part of the pipeline, it rotates it under a named heading. Platypus, or PlatyPS, whatever it is, creates everything in this docs folder. In this docs folder is a markdown file for each public function that kind of details the function, its parameters, how to use it, any gotchas, kind of things like that. On the gallery, we should now see that new version of, of PS Link. So, um, yeah, 11 dot, and no one's downloaded it yet, but it's done two minutes ago. So, yeah, this, is, this was, uh, was game-changing for me. This really enabled me to accelerate everything I do. There's a few modules that I maintain, but when I adopted it, things at work as well, like it just it enables you to kind of rotate and pivot a lot more quicker through the life cycle of your code. Um, yeah, it's... Uh, Trying to think, is there anything else I want to mention here? No. Okay, cool. So, um, questions. Hopefully, don't have to have questions, but uh, if anybody has any questions, now's a, a good time. When do you, do you tend to run your, um, say, you've got unit tests along the way? Yeah. Do you, can you even have it running those locally? Like local yeah. Running the test you know totally. Locally. Yeah, so I kind of lied earlier when I said, oh, uh, when I, when I said I focused on adding the code and that was it, it's like, no, I, I ran tests locally to make sure I wasn't going to mess up today. So, yeah, totally. I, um, and a really cool thing is in VS Code, you can have ba -ba -da -ba, you can have a tasks.json file. And in here, you can basically create tasks. So I have one called build. And I'll show you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I don't know how... I haven't had a Mac long, so I don't even know how to use, really. OK, cool. Yeah, so task.json file in your VS Code directory. And this is relevant. I'll explain why. Um, I have a bunch of tasks called build, build with docs, build Docker container, tests. So now, when I'm developing locally and I just want to make sure I haven't broken anything, I can hit F1, run task, tests, and that would create an integrated console in VS Code, use the, the Docker container that I have running, and just run my pasta script file so that I don't have to invoke my pipeline to do the tests. I can do it locally. So is, that, is that performing a build before running the test, or is it just doing it? 
Um, both. I can choose. Yeah, so I can choose to build and test the built artifact or test with the, um, like the, the development code that I have that's not built. So there's a lot of flexibility here. There's no one size fits all on how you make your pipeline. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, that GitHub action lets you like specify which you know container you actually want to run in, if it's Windows or Linux. Or yeah, absolutely. Or what have you, because you might say, oh, it works on my machine. <laughs> Sure. Yeah. So the call out was um, uh, just to make sure that you, your your runner, your pipeline is as close as environment to uh, as production as possible. The example it was given was, um, you know, with GitHub Actions, you can specify, hey, do this in Windows, do this in Ubuntu, do this in Mac OS, and just being able to kind of, if your code is environment specific, it has those dependencies. Yeah, absolutely, that's true. And what's great about GitHub Actions is that you can have um, self-hosted runners. So if you had scripts that needed Active Directory and you wanted to test against the domain controller your scripts, you could have a pipeline that runs on an act, a, like a dummy domain controller that does your Active Directory bits. But preferably, and this is kind of all circumstantial, circumstantial, you would um, mock those functions which um, do the calls to AD so that you don't need AD. But then that's a whole other discussion of, um, well, what if there's changes to AD that breaks your code? But yeah, no, that's a good point to make. Thank you. Yeah. Do you have advice for doing pipelines, but having the ability to do them on multiple branches? So like if I have a dev mm. branch and I want that to be like my preview module, yeah. do you have guidance or advice on I, how to do that? I don't, yeah, only because I haven't done it yet and I want to. Okay. Yeah, no, it's solid. It's a great, we, we do it at work. Um, so if somebody, we, we have several branches, and if somebody checks in code to the develop branch, it um, kind of creates a pre-release tag. It gives them an MSI that's kind of still like a, like a built artifact, still signed and such, but it's not uh, an MSI we would give to a customer. So yeah, it's achievable. So the question was, do I have any guidance on um, uh, having a pipeline for alternative branches, like a development branch or other branches. I don't, but it is a good practice to do, so that you don't always invoke your branch on the main branch. And it's great, too, because if you had a way to make your tests run without needing the container on your laptop, on any branch, on, a, a, on, a, on your preferred CI runner, that's the dream, so that you can just check in on any branch and then you would know that your CI runner would do at least tests. Not necessarily kind of deploy, but just tests. Yeah, yeah. I don't have guidance, but um, I can't imagine it would be too much different other than in your GitHub Action workflow file, maybe supporting different branches. Maybe you would have a different workflow that are specific to other branches beyond main and master. Um, that would maybe do everything else except deploy, maybe. But yeah, no, that's good. I don't have a module I maintain. What might be a use case for me? I want to start, but what, 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 what can I do? What can you do with it? What's the okay. use case? Yes, yeah, well, I want to use it for right? Yeah. I'm not sure what the sure. So what sort of code do you write? <laughs> yeah, sure. So, um, like user account creation, is that like a script that you've written and maintain? Yeah. yeah? Okay, cool. So, um, and who calls that script? Do you run it? Service desk? Where do they get the script from? Uh, GitLab. GitLab? So, you would, as an example, modify your code on your laptop or your desktop and you would test it maybe in your lab or maybe in production, whatever you want to do. But instead of copy and pasting it um, to wherever it needs to go, GitLab, maybe they pull it straight from the repository. Do they put it straight from, oh, okay. Maybe there's not so much of a use case there. So they get it straight from the repo. 
Yeah. To add to the, the sure, yeah. There are uh, things you can do, such as like security scanning and setting up mm. scanning. Yeah. So Absolutely, hundred percent. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. So not necessarily the deployment part, but definitely the things that focus on CI. Yeah. No, oh, thank you. Yeah, Adam. Sorry, um, sorry, so Are you all good? Yeah. Could he? Sorry, I don't use Hester yet. I want to get. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what was suggested. Yeah, so they can do lint testing, make sure it's yeah. not secrets, and still test it. Yeah, totally. So I guess the your use case, yeah, would totally be everything except deployment, pretty much. Yeah, yeah, especially with secrets. That's a really good point. I never really thought about making sure code doesn't contain secrets. Yeah. So sorry, is there a dedicated action to check if your codes contain any open files? That's a good question. Yeah. Th um, so in GitHub Actions. There are a lot of community modules, which are called just actions on the marketplace. And there might be, I think there might be security analyzer tools, maybe, freely available. Oh. Really? What's it called, sorry? P PS Secret Scanner. So that's um, probably spelling it wrong. Secrets, plural or secret? Secret, singular. Singular. Find secret. Nice. Yeah, no, I'll check this out. I think, um, yeah, I guess one thing I'll say is um, I actually wrote my own pipeline without using module builder and sampler, and I completely regret it. I wish I used boilerplate code. I spent so much time, because I was so averse to using frameworks. I was very much of the mindset, hey, I kind of, if I'm going to support it, I need to know everything about it. But then I've kind of grown up a little bit, and I've kind of relinquished a little bit. But the point I'm making is that I'm definitely going to add this to my pipeline. And you can totally probably still add it to those module builder or sampler. But the idea here is, is that there's no one size fits all of any pipeline you can kind of add bits that you want and need anywhere in the process. I'm definitely going to add that. So thanks for sharing that. Any other questions? Are we good? Yeah, go for it. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. So the Windows container image, I think it also includes both 7 and 5, but absolutely it will include 5. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, do you, yeah. I don't know if they have any op any kind of image for client today. Is it just server? Sorry. Licensing is no, that's true. Yeah, yeah. So you would have access to a full blown Windows Server VM container, but yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, if that's it, well, thanks for coming, and I hope you found it useful. And um, yeah, thank you. <laughs>